An old Chinese proverb states, may you be cursed to live in interesting times. It suggests that periods of change, while often exciting, can also present unwanted and difficult challenges. And so it is in the fishing world. On the one hand, we're blessed with an ever-expanding array of new technology that helps us find and catch fish more quickly and efficiently than ever before. I just got bumped there a second ago. Oh, they're twisting and progressive fisheries management, including the stocking of game fish species, has resulted in some of the best fishing ever for walleyes, muskies, and smallmouth bass. Some folks feel these are indeed the best of times, and they'd be right. On the other hand, naysayers point out that we also face the spread of invasive species in some fishing waters, unwittingly introduced and spread through a lack of knowledge and prevention. While these small yet potent invaders undoubtedly create problems and force anglers to adjust to their presence, we believe that the forecast is far from heralding the worst of times. Because once you understand the problems, you can take positive steps to prevent or minimize their harmful impacts. Today on The Edge, we examine the potential impacts of invasive species and what we can do about them to keep fisheries thriving and fishing on the rise. Then we detail the explosive growth of muskie fishing opportunities throughout North America and the increased potential for catching fish of monstrous proportions. Oh, there's one. Good one. Good one. Wow, Jim. Big fish, man. Holy smokes. The times, they are a-changing. And we, as anglers, need to keep pace with positive changes while restricting the spread of negative ones. Oh, there's one. Nice, nice. Big fish, man. Whoa! Closed captioning provided by Fraybill FXE Stormsuit. You know, in my home state of Minnesota, walleyes are state fish. And uh, uh, walleye fishing is big business. We're home to some of the best walleye uh, lakes in the world. Lakes like Mille Lac, Leech, Winnie, Cass, uh, a Red Lake, Rainy Lake, Lake of the Woods, Vermilion. These are all really big bodies of water with huge, huge populations of walleyes in them. And uh, you get out on structures le like this, on this piece, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 boats. And uh, I'd ride around this lake and there's different structures that the schools of fish are on and there's oodles of boats on them. Walleye fishing is big, big business in this state like it is in, in uh, many states on many, many bodies of water. And uh, uh, the concern <laughs> is to make sure it stays healthy and strong. You know, we got problems with a bite of a fish like this the economy is impacted in a big way, and we don't want to see that happen. The state of Minnesota relies heavily on dollars generated by walleye fishing and tourism. Some 1.5 million anglers spend about $3 billion per year fishing in Minnesota, with walleyes being the most popular game fish species. 
Understandably, the state does everything it can to both foster and protect this fishery. Progressive fisheries management, including slot limits, has helped bring the Minnesota walleye fishery to an all-time high. Fisheries managers, understandably, don't want to see their efforts diminished due to the spread of invasive species. But simple scare tactics won't solve this problem. Education is the key. As anglers become aware of how invasive species are spread, they're able to take proactive rather than reactive measures to prevent or reduce the threat. The ripple effect of invasive species are felt both short and long term, and no one has a crystal ball allowing them to fully foresee the future. But rest assured that the problem is being addressed at both the state and federal levels, and that by working together we can and will make a positive difference. Let's match them up. Huh? Look at that. Go ahead. Get yours, and mine is coming your way. Okay. You got her? Oh, I got her. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, watch it. Uh, all going. Yeah. You know, when you got walleye fishing like this, <laughs> you know, we're in pretty good shape. You know, the stocking program here in Minnesota is, is really good right now. And, uh, Things are really looking up. We got a lot of big fish in a lot of lakes, and the slot, the slot limits seem to be working. And uh, you know, in Mille Lacs here, we go. This fish is too big for the slot. We got to throw this fish back. But you know, there's still a few things on the horizon, and not necessarily on the horizon. They're already here, that really worry me. And uh, that's the invasive species problem that we have. And uh, you know, a lot of people are kind of. Uh, laid back, you might say, about the invasive species thing. They don't really see it as a huge problem, but there are a few of those invasive species, namely the zebra mussel, and we've got quagga mussels coming, which is our close cousin. We've got spiny water fleas, and we've got rusty crayfish. And all of those, potentially, are huge problems for walleye fishing. And so that's what we got to worry about right now. While many non-native species pose potential threats to fisheries and aquatic habitats, those of the most widespread concern include zebra and quagga mussels transported to U.S. waters from Europe in the bilges of ocean-going vessels pose the greatest threat to our fisheries. Once introduced to new systems, they strain nutrients from the water, consuming the green algae, which is the good algae, and rejecting the blue-green or bad algae. The amount of filtration is astounding. On Minnesota's Mille Lacs Lake, for example, the water is being totally filtered once a week. Quagga mussels are known to colonize much deeper water than zebra mussels, so they strain even more water. The loss of nutrients from this filtration can diminish the carrying capacity of the system, leading to reductions in fish population and growth. Anglers typically must adjust to fishing clearer water conditions than in the past as nutrient levels diminish. Rusty crayfish are native to the Ohio River Basin and are most likely transported to other waters as live bait in bait buckets. They are large, fierce species that outcompete native crayfish populations, shred aquatic weed growth, and potentially eat the eggs of walleyes and other species. Anglers will likely notice diminished rooted vegetation and a resulting shift of large game fish to alternative feeding locales. Spiny water fleas are actually zooplankton that reach one-fourth to five-eighth inch in the adult phase. They eat smaller zooplankton like Daphnia and can reduce the food supply for bait fish and young of the year fish. Anglers will most likely notice gobs of them on their fishing lines and following their guides on fishing rods. They're another European transplant transported in bait buckets and live wells. You know, one thing about uh the zebra mussels is uh, what they're doing to some of our diving birds, like loons, for instance. Um, uh, just within the last few years, around the Great Lakes area, they've recovered about 9,000 dead loons who have died because of avian botulism, which has been induced by the zebra mussels. What happens is the zebes, the zebes as I mentioned before, will eat that uh, green algae, but they'll leave blue-green algae. The blue-green algae then dies sinks to the bottom uh, and becomes infested with this, this uh, botulism. And the bait fish, like the gobies in the case of the Great Lakes, come along, eat some of the, eat this bad algae, so to speak, and they themselves become infected and then they get eaten by the loons and other diving birds, which die from botul avian botulism. 
The biggest problem in trying to stop the spread of invasives is that you can't always see them. For example, juvenile zebra mussels, called velagers, are microscopic in size, so they can be unintentionally transported to other waters in bait buckets, live wells, bilge water, in carpeted trailer bunks, or inside your boat trailer. Faced with the potential threat of these and other non-native invaders, you can take some simple precautions to prevent their spread. If your boat has been exposed to invasive species, remove your drain plug to empty water out of your boat before leaving the access site. Empty your bait buckets and never transport live minnows or crayfish from one body of water to another. Rinse your boat and trailer in water heated to at least 140 degrees Fahrenheit to kill larval mussels or let your boat and trailer dry for at least five days before launching in another body of water or take it to a designated decontamination station. Be sure to check your state regulations before transporting any boat that has been in infested waters. Yep. How's that? Huh? Yeah. How's Beautiful. that for a walleye? <laughs> like we were saying, we want to make sure that walleye fishing stays good in the future on all of our, our great walleye lakes across the country so you can catch big numbers of fish like this. And that's what this show was about today, to encourage you to do your part, you know, in creating an awareness, like I said, following the laws of the land. So we got quality fisheries in the future. Not only as good as it is today, it could even be a little bit better. But we got some issues. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe we'll find a solution. And uh, that's my prayer, that we'll find a solution so I can keep catching big walleyes like this. Hey, for more detailed information or to purchase any products you've seen on this show, go to lindermedia.com. You know, muskies unquestionably are one of the premier uh, sport fish in North America today, and we have more of them because of uh, Department of Natural Resources have stocked them in waters all across the country. But it wasn't that long ago, realistically, muskies were actually commercially fished, which is really interesting that they used to actually go out and net them in Lake Erie and other bodies of water. From the Ohio River Basin to the Minnesota North Woods, muskies have faced a long history of overfishing, spearing, habitat degradation, and other challenges dating back to the 1800s. Being a low density, top of the line predator, muskies are extremely vulnerable to commercial netting which virtually wiped out native muskie populations in Green Bay of Lake Michigan, Maumee Bay of Lake Erie, and other locations around the Great Lakes. Loss of spawning and rearing habitat played a continuing role in population collapse throughout the muskie world. Angling over harvest took a similar toll. Muskie derbies in the mid-1900s fostered a catch and kill epic, with proud anglers hoisting a generation of muskie broodstock before cameras. Thousands upon thousands of big fish perished beneath the onslaught as the fish met the legal size limit were harvested for fame, fortune, and food. This catch and kill mentality prevailed until 1966 when Gil Ham and a group of innovators founded Muskies Inc. Its primary objective was to revitalize muskie fishing through a combination of stocking, encouraging progressive management strategies, and promoting the revolutionary concept of catch and release. As anglers and fisheries departments gradually accepted these modern practices, existing muskie populations rebounded. Oh, oh, there's one. Good one. Good one. Wow, Jim. Big fish, man. New waters Holy were stocked, smokes. and the numbers and size of available fish began to rival and even surpass those in historic proportions. <laughs> More than likely, the biggest reason that we have such a good muskie fishery today is because of two things, angler ethics, Almost all anglers today that muskie fish release everything they catch and strict regulations. Minnesota used to be a 40 inch minimum. You could keep a fish over 40 inches. That's our average today. Now it's 48 inches. Ontario's 54 inches. It's regulations and angler ethics like that that have produced great fisheries across the country. You know, 
along with these quality fisheries, probably one of the biggest things is, that, you know, you're talking about angler ethics, is also the anglers are actually have the right tools to release these fish. When you look in the boat here, most musky fishermen are rigged up with bolt cutters, hookouts, jaw spreaders, a big deep net, like we got this frayable net that sits in the water by the side of the boat when you're going to release the fish and it really minimizes delayed mortality. So more of the fish are surviving that are caught to be re-caught again and eventually grow to real whoppers like that one Jeremy just let go. We're fishing today on one of my favorite fisheries and it's Minnesota's famed Leech Lake. There was a historical muskie event that happened here in the 1950s called the Leech Lake Muskie Rampage where a group of guys went out and just pounded the muskies from Federal Dam out in Portage Bay. But realistically, that pounding that they had in the 50s that has been so famed and published all over the country is a fairly common occurrence. We fish muskies a lot up here and it's not uncommon for two anglers over the course of the season to maybe have a few days where you boat between five and ten fish. If you were to have that happen and you were to be standing with a group of guys that all had six muskies, it would look exactly like the pictures in the old days. And again, it all just comes back to angler ethics and good management. Got her, big one, big one. That's that big one, yep. Got there we go. Got her, big one. Came up and lunched at Jim. It was so awesome. Her whole mouth just came up and inhaled the bait. I'm gonna go to the front. Boy, that's fun. I am very gliding, excited. Glide, the Five bites in like 25 gliding. minutes. The management and culture of muskies began on Lake Chautauqua in New York in 1888 with a permanent hatchery facility completed there in 1904. Early experiments with fry stocking proved to be prohibitively expensive due to the extremely low survival of individual muskies related to predation and other factors. Raising one to three year old fingerlings in ponds and stocking them into lakes and rivers in the fall proved to be a much better alternative due to enhanced survival. Fish are usually stocked at a rate of one half to two fingerlings per acre depending on whether the population needs to be merely supplemented or totally maintained by stocking. In the end, it usually costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 for every stock fingerling that survives its first 18 months in the wild. During the mid-1900s when angler harvest was high, biologists estimated they needed to replace each adult muskie every five to seven years in order to maintain fishable populations. By the late 1990s, after catch and release had been adopted in earnest, that figure rose to replacing each fish only once in their lifetime, meaning perhaps every 15 or 20 years. Returning fish to the water to be caught again is by far the best and most cost-effective use of the resource. Today, over 98% of muskies caught are released by anglers. Self-sustaining fisheries with good population and rearing conditions don't require stocking. Even so, Stocking has undoubtedly proven successful on many waters. See that, how that pelvic fin is missing? That's what a stock musky. That's, that's how they can fin. tell if they're stocked or reproducing naturally. Good. All right. Some 37 states have ongoing musky programs incorporating either natural or tiger muskies. Got him. Got Big him. one. There we Boy, go. Wow. Oh. Man, what a difference it makes. It's Change the presentation. Sudden, yeah, we changed. We were burning bucktails earlier. It seemed like that's the I'm only thing up, we could Jim. get them to move Just on. Just stay there. Just stay yeah, there the for a second. That's a big one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Hang on. Hang on. I'm trying to. There we go. I'm trying to get it. Yeah, there you go. Pull it. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's a good one. That's a nice fish. Yes. Without a doubt, muskies are more abundant, available, and bigger than ever. <laughs> As angler interest and participation continues to grow, more and more pressure will be placed on existing muskie fisheries. To continue experiencing these great fish at this level in the future, we need to support conservation groups like Muskies Inc. and let legislators know muskie fisheries are sought after destinations that are socially and economically important. Now is the time to take advantage of the great muskie opportunities that exist all around the country, and now is the time to take the steps for the future of muskie fishing. Got her! There you got her. Woo! That was kind of fun! Oh, look at that! Oh, there's one. Nice.
Nice, nice, big fish, man. Wow. Oh, wow. there's one. Whoa. Wow. Whoa. Oh, James. Musky fishing is an efficiency game, and you need to put the percentages in your favor to locate and catch them. Discover how to track down and make them bite in Musky Logic, part of our Angling Edge instructional DVD collection, available at anglingedge.com. This is one of my all-time favorite Bibles. It's titled The American Patriots Bible and it talks about many influential people and their different experiences in life. Most of you know who J.C. Penney is. Let me read this to you. First of all, it says, all of mankind searches for meaning and purpose in life. Earthly goals that do not lead to God only bring dissatisfaction, frustration, and uncertainty. American businessman J. Cash J.C. Penney came to a similar conclusion. Through hard work and a thrifty lifestyle, J.C. Penney succeeded in building one of America's most prestigious retail franchises. But during the Great Depression, heavy financial losses caused him enormous stress, which led to a life-threatening illness. While in the hospital, believing he was going to die, Penney wrote a farewell letter to his wife and his son. When he awoke the next morning, he went for a walk down the hallway of the hospital and heard singing coming from the chapel. He went in the chapel and listened with a heavy heart. The song, God Will Take Care of You, spoke to him deeply. In a life-transforming instant, Penny discovered that God was there to help. From that day on, my life has been free from worry, he later declared. Even in the midst of potential life-threatening circumstances, J.C. Penny along with the preacher of Ecclesiastes, found the answer to all of life, love of God. Hey, from all of us here at the Edge, you have a good safe mission season. We'll see you on the water. Hey, I sure want to take an opportunity to thank all our sponsor partners for making this show possible. And if you like what you see, let them know and support them. For more information, check us out at anglingedge.com, Facebook, or the YouTube channel. Hey, thanks for watching.